Over the last year, we've seen doctors, nurses, paramedics and radiographers go on strike. We've seen waiting lists reach record highs for non-urgent operations, and the public satisfaction has reached an all-time low since the British Social Attitude Survey began. But how has it got to this point? What mistakes were made by successive governments, and how can we start to rebuild one of the UK's greatest assets. Hi, I'm Dr. Ollie, a junior doctor based in the UK, and I've got to credit the inspiration for this video to Chris Ham, who authored a brilliant paper by the King's Fund looking to answer these very questions. Our story starts at the turn of the century. The winter of 1999 to 2000 was particularly bad for the NHS. A&E was overrun, there were long waiting lists, and that all led the then Labour government to commit to an unprecedented funding increase for the NHS on a multi-year scale. These increases in funding and plans for specific services led to real, measurable, improved outcomes in the NHS. For example, the median waiting times in the NHS in 2000 was 12.9 weeks, and that went to just 4.3 weeks in 2010. The outpatient waiting times went from 4.8 weeks in 2005 to 2.7 weeks in 2010. So you're waiting less than three weeks on average to be seen by a doctor at the hospital if you're referred by your GP compared to today's NHS, where you could be waiting, you know, up to six months. And then the percentage of patients treated in A&E under four hours, which is a key target that sort of all A&Es and all hospitals work towards, they want to see and treat and either discharge or admit a patient in under four hours. That percentage was 78% in 2003 and increased to 98% in 2009. So 98% of patients in A&E were being seen and dealt with in under four hours. So you don't have like today, people waiting on trolleys, waiting in corridors for hours and hours and hours to be seen and treated by a doctor. This led to an independent assessment saying there had been considerable progress in moving the NHS towards being a high performing health system. Public satisfaction reached an all time high with the NHS in 2010, and there were significant increases in staffing and pay as a result of new contracts for healthcare workers. So, this set the groundwork for the NHS to be able to slash waiting times for referrals to happen quicker and just overall for healthcare to be delivered at a higher quality. There was also during this period the establishment of NICE, which if you haven't heard of it, is sort of the National Institute for Health and Care Excellence. And it does a load of great stuff from writing guidelines for doctors to deciding which new medications should be brought in on the NHS for patients. But one crucial role of it with this increase in funding and money was it was able to target resources at high priority areas of care so that the money, the staff and sort of the attention was going where it was most needed. The global financial crash in 2008 and the election of the Liberal Democrat Conservative coalition government in 2010 heralded a marked change for the NHS. Because of the global market crash, everyone had to tighten their belts and the NHS was no different. The NHS was going to have to make do with funding increases at a far lower level than it had enjoyed in the past few years. So efficiencies had to be found. The same service had to be provided to an increasingly large population with increasing health needs, but for the same or slightly more money, but not at an increased level of funding as it had previously been getting over sort of the period of 2000 to 2010. The biggest areas in which these efficiencies were found were cuts in the prices paid to providers and a staff pay freeze. By providers, that's essentially anyone who provides a service for the NHS. So for example, a hospital trust, they may provide hip replacements for patients in their local area. And for every hip replacement they carry out, they'll get paid a standard tariff by the NHS, a standard amount of money that will cover their costs, all their equipment and their staff, and hopefully get a bit of money extra to sort of be able to put into their pool and use in other areas of the running of the hospital that might not be so profitable. It's the same with GP practice as well, that sort of operate as small businesses. For each new patient a GP diagnoses as say, a new diabetic and starts them on the correct new treatment, they'll get a bit of money from the NHS at large to cover their costs of dealing with that diabetic as a new chronic patient. Pay freezes implemented following the 2008 
financial crash is almost sort of the seed of why we're at where we are now today with the strikes from doctors, from nurses, from ambulance staff. Although staff didn't get a pay cut because they didn't continue to see pay increases because the government was trying to save money by not you know, giving their staff raises because they weren't getting those increases. Staff over the period enjoyed real terms pay loss. So because inflation was continuing to go up, they're in real terms, the money they were getting was reducing and reducing and reducing. Although the NHS had it bad, other public services arguably had it even worse. For example, education and housing. And these are often viewed as sort of wider determinants of health. For example, if someone is in a council house and it's in really poor condition, there's mould everywhere, they're more likely to sort of have their asthma exacerbated if there's mould, there's dust, they're going to be more likely to have an asthma attack, have to go to hospital and then so use NHS resources in dealing with that. If the housing had been in better condition, if their health had been in better condition, then they probably wouldn't have to, had to use that service in the first place. So there's sort of a knock-on effect of government spending reducing in these other areas that can then go on to further impact the NHS and costing it more money. NHS performance actually held up relatively well in the first three years of the coalition government because it was all a bit of a stopgap operation, sort of the financial crash had happened, belts were tightened and it was sort of let's just get through this period before we can then sort of increase our funding again after the economy has recovered. But it was after that sort of three year period that when funding didn't increase and that funding was still restricted, that's when we sort of saw these metrics of NHS performance really start to drop off. And the winter of 2014, 2015 was particularly bad with sort of a &E's sort of straight back in the headlines for these massive waits, people waiting on trolleys, people not meeting that four hour target to be seen or discharged. Throughout this period, health leaders were working on implementing the coalition government's reforms devised by then health secretary, Andrew Lansley and critics of these reforms sort of said lots of time, money and effort over that period that should have been working on becoming a more efficient health service to deal with these reductions in fundings was actually spent just sort of restructuring the NHS when that really wasn't what it needed at that time. The Conservative government elected in 2015 continued to exercise really tight control of the public spending and spending on healthcare in what became known as sort of a decade of austerity. While there were increases agreed by the government for health spending, these were arguably insufficient to deal with the deficits that had essentially built up over the last five years from this sort of stopgap operation of just trying to make things run to try and get by with less and less money while service demand continued to increase. And the Department of Health actually came really close to sort of overrunning its budget in 2015, 2016, and it was only very narrowly avoided by essentially some clever accounting. Towards the end of 2017, Simon Stevens, who was then the chief executive of the NHS, took the unusual step of speaking publicly about the impact that these years and years and years of constrained funding and constrained resources had had on the NHS. And he's quoted as saying, the NHS can no longer do everything that is being asked of it. So he was essentially going to the government, he's going to the then Prime Minister, who was Theresa May, and saying, we need more money for the healthcare service because as a result of not having enough money, the NHS is failing and it's just not able to provide the service that it's there to do. So his discussions with Whitehall and the government, they actually did bear fruit because to coincide with the 70th anniversary of the NHS in 2018, an extra £20 billion were committed to the NHS by Theresa May that was meant to come in over the next five years from 2018. Despite a pledge to increase funding, July 2019 saw the highest proportion of people spending more than four hours in A&E than any previous July in the last five years, which was showing what was previously just a winter problem with, you know, winter pressures on A&E and loads of patients having to go in the hospital was now pretty much becoming an all-round problem. a &Es were busy all the time. It wasn't just winter pressures. As the decade drew to a close and even before COVID hit, so nothing to do with the pandemic, performance against waiting time targets was still pretty poor and financial deficits still persisted within the NHS. So probably the biggest and most obvious reason to explain the decline of the NHS is that of constrained resources. Essentially, the NHS was just not getting enough money. It was being suffocated of the funding that it so desperately needed. And as a result, 
its performance massively suffered between 2010 and the present day. With international comparison, so looking at sort of other EU countries, we can see that between 2010 and 2019, the UK's health spending would have been £40 billion a year higher had the UK simply matched the average of other EU countries. Comparisons also show that the UK has a lower healthcare capacity compared to peer countries. And what I mean by that is we have fewer doctors, we have fewer nurses, we have fewer hospital beds, and we even have fewer scanners. Although the NHS is one of the most efficient healthcare systems in the world, if you don't have the money going into it, no matter how efficient that is, we you know, you're just not able to get those sort of outcomes from it, which lead to those reduced beds, reduced doctors, that is just really struggling to meet the rising and rising demands of an aging population that we have today. Capital spending is definitely another factor that can be used to explain the decline of the NHS over the period of sort of 2010 to present day. Successive governments sought to protect the NHS running costs by diverting the Department of Health's funding from things like spending on maintenance of hospital buildings, of GP practices, all this sort of capital that comes under the umbrella of capital spending and using it for more short-term things like, you know, in a winter crisis when A&Es are doing really poorly to be able to pay for more staff then. So although that was a short-term fix, it's all sort of added up over the last decade to mean that now we're currently got a deficit of about 10 billion pounds estimated, sort of a capital deficit of 10 billion pounds to deal with all that maintenance that has just been sort of ignored and swept down under the carpet that is now essentially getting to breaking point where hospitals need this maintenance because it's just been completely neglected. Not only were funds for new building and equipment in short supply, but it also extends to things like IT systems and operating systems. Now, the NHS, although brilliant, if you've ever worked in it, you'll know that a lot of the computer systems used in a lot of the hospitals, GP practices, are really old and pretty clunky and are in major need of an upgrade. But because of the size and scale of the NHS, any sort of system-wide upgrade to the computer systems will take a huge amount of effort and money and time. And because there hasn't been that sort of stepwise upgrade in systems over the previous decade, again, similar to the maintenance, it's all just built up and up and up and meant now that lots of doctors' time is used sort of in this more administrative role, maybe fighting with the computer, fighting with the printer, whereas it could have been spent seeing more patients. The third factor that I'm gonna to touch on explaining the decline of the NHS is that of workforce planning. Now, workforce shortages are a chronic problem that have plagued the NHS since its inception, but it has got particularly bad in the last decade. In much the same vein as sort of capital spending and sort of estates, um, training budgets were raided by the government to deal with these more short-term problems. Now, while that sort of papers over the cracks for now, the problem with workforce planning and training is that it takes about 10 years to train a doctor from student to fully qualified doctor. And so now that we're seeing that we didn't have enough doctors coming through the pipeline 10 years ago, five years ago, this very day, that means this problem of workforce shortages and shortages of doctors of nurses is going to continue to be a problem for potentially the next 10 years because that's how long it's going to take to get these fresh faces through the pipeline. There are currently well in excess of 100,000 staff vacancies within the NHS just to show you the scale of the problem and I'd have to say staff pay and conditions is a whole nother issue that just worsens the whole deal. So where next? Well the improvements between 2000 and 2010 prove that the NHS is capable of reform and improving its outcomes and performance against targets if the political will exists and if it's given sort of the right environment to improve and thrive. Unfortunately, there aren't going to be many, if any, quick fixes. A government needs to take a long-term view when it comes to the NHS and its future. What this means is a long-term view when it comes to workforce planning, when it comes to reducing that state's deficit, when it comes to ensuring that we have doctors that don't want to leave the NHS because of poor pay and working conditions in five, 10 years time. There are some basic things that we do know. We know prevention is better than cure. So we also need to address those wider determinants of health, a focus on public health spending, you know, getting people to lose weight, stop smoking, exercise, really basic, boring stuff that will genuinely 
help the NHS. We know that primary care almost always delivers healthcare in a more efficient manner than secondary care. So that means putting more effort and funding towards GPs, towards doing things in the community that are potentially traditionally done in hospitals because we can do them just as well, but a lot cheaper in the community at GPs rather than have patients be in hospital as an inpatient. The future of the NHS in 5, 10, 15, 20 years time will be shaped by decisions on these issues today and the ability to moderate demand for healthcare to, so to actually try and help curtail that growing and growing demand for healthcare and to involve the public and patients in an active part in dealing with this NHS crisis and be active participants in their own health.